Gerard Stewart and I'm the uh, yeah hi I'm Gerard Stewart I'm the um, communications coordinator for the natural flood risk management program and just before I hand over to Ian as uh, a couple of housekeeping points and a, a brief introduction I'd like to to make so um, your microphone should be switched off when you join us and uh, so you should see a red symbol which shows that they're, they're muted uh, so yeah please keep those off and your videos as well should be off red as well um, if you do have questions please do um, and during the webinar is good as well it's good to get some conversation going on via the chat function so you can see the, the speech bubble um, option with a little circle there. Um, if you click on that, you can type in. You can either send a message to everyone. If you do want to send a message to uh, an individual, you you can do that as well. Um, we will have 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions. And thanks to those of you who some submitted some questions in advance. Uh, we are recording the video at the uh, and um, that will be made available on our website. Um, after, shortly after we finish. So the, the NFM research program, it's a four year uh, NERC funded program um, and we're carrying out novel science to improve our understanding of where possible, including quantification. Uh, we're looking at a range of NFM measures in different types of catchments, flooding scenarios, and at different scales. And our aim is to improve evidence and understanding for policymakers and practitioners. Could, could I just ask that you um, mute your microphones, please? I can hear a bit of background noise there. Um, a, a key key to the success of the program is working with uh, partners uh, in a collaborative way. And today is an, an example of that because it, it isn't actually working directly on the program, but it, it's working on related areas. Um, so Ian um, is an associate professor at Harriet Watt University and carries out research in a range of areas on flood risk management. Uh, including NFM, but also urban flood risk and flood forecasting. Um, so Ian, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. I'll just um, share my screen with everyone. I could see your slides now, Ian. Ian, I can't hear you. Are you are you muted? Oh, yes, you are actually. I've just done. Ian, sorry, Ian. You, yeah, you were muted then. Sorry. 
if it's working to start again. <laughs> Everyone can see my slides. Okay, uh, so um, I'm going to be uh, talking about the research that we've been carrying out. It happens, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, what's going on? Oh, it was very, very loud, and now it's. Okay, um, so I'm going to be um, giving a presentation on um, a project that I carried out uh, with the soil security. Uh, funded by NERC. Um, and this was all on uh, soil compaction and the impacts on uh, catchment scale flood uh, risk. Um, so um, my research and uh, flood risk management has kind of evolved over time from in the 70s and 80s where we uh, drained the land, tried to get rid of the water uh, from the landscape as quickly as possible um, to a policy of uh, flood defence um, in the 90s. Um, to what we now, which is much more holistic in terms of its uh, uh, management approach. Um, and uh, I'm going to be focusing in on the, the catchment scale uh, natural flood management element of my, my research in today's seminar. Well, here's a brief outline of my talk. Uh, so firstly, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of natural flood risk management. Uh, focusing in on some of the hydrological processes um, that will be important in interpreting some of the data that we've collected. Um, and then I'm going to move on to uh, two bits of work that we've carried out. Uh, one at the local scale, uh, which is all thinking about the heterogeneity and variability in uh, soil compaction and physical soil characteristics. And then I'll be outlining a second study where we've tried to upscale uh, some data in terms of uh, soil compaction uh, to the catchment scale uh, to see whether these kind of measures can have an impact at the larger uh, scales. Um, and that will also give some thoughts about how we can target uh, natural flood management and to become more effective um, in its approach. And then I'll be uh, giving some conclusions at the end of the seminar. Okay, so let's start by thinking about what uh, natural uh, flood risk uh, management is um, and uh, measures that uh, protect and restore and emulate natural functions of catchments and floodplains. Um, and uh, one of the approaches that I like to take is thinking about the um, different hydrological uh, processes um, that are operating um, um, and um, the uh, kind of the different hydrological process that, processes that are operating. Um, okay, so um, Ian, Ian, sorry to interrupt. There's, there's quite a lot of noise on the line. Please, could could you keep quiet if you're if you're listening because it, it's disruptive to other people. Um, and if you could please un please mute your microphone, which is the uh, the, well, the little micro, the circular microphone symbol. If you just click on that, it should go red, and that will mean uh, you won't you won't um, get the uh, transmission of noise from around you. Okay, thanks very much. Sorry, sorry, Ian. Please carry on. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so thinking about the different hydrological processes that are operating, um, we can think about the the rainfall input into the system, um, but then also um, where my talk is going to uh, focus in on today. Um, is thinking about the effect of this on the uh, hydrological cycle and the uh, process of infiltration uh, and the partitioning of rainfall into runoff. Um, so you can see here a lot of uh, arable and uh, pastoral agriculture can have a significant impact on the soil characteristics and how water uh, interacts with the soil. Um, if the water infiltrates into the soil, then uh, it goes through the much slower uh, subsurface through flow pathway uh, normally, um, uh, or if it isn't and the ground is saturated, which is often what we get when the soil is heavily compacted, then we get lots of surface uh, overland flow runoff uh, and that uh, gets delivered to rivers very quickly. Um, and if those pathways are connected to the uh, channel, then that's when um, 
that water is going to contribute to the downstream hydrograph. Um, um, so another way in which um, it could be uh, mitigated against is through storage of the, the water as well. And then finally, if it gets to the uh, channel itself, then we have to think about the uh, contribution from the different tributaries uh, in the system and the timing of these and the sequencing of them in terms of uh, determining what the downstream hydrograph is. And some of the work later in my presentation will highlight the importance um, of uh, the different tributary inputs into the system and how we can use that information um, to target where we deploy natural flood risk management. Uh, and this controls um, the water quantity, um, the floods and the low flows potentially as well. It just shows um, different uh, natural flood risk management options. And the one that I'm going to be focusing in on is uh, the agricultural landscape where we can think about mitigating uh, soil compaction um, to try and store more water, uh, store more water in the soil uh, and therefore less being contributed to rivers. Okay, so let's start off by uh, defining what soil compaction is. Um, so here's a, a definition here. Uh, it's defined as the process by which uh, soil grains are rearranged uh, to decrease pore space, thereby increasing the bulk density. And we see this process happening in both uh, arable landscapes, such as the top one there, uh, which shows um, that you can see the uh, the tram lines uh, from the uh, tractors that uh, traffic over the the fields, but also in uh, pastoral uh, landscapes as well, when the animals uh, move over the landscape and trample the ground, uh, particularly around features such as uh, field gates that are shown in that photograph there. Uh, and this obviously impacts on the way in which rainfall impacts uh, in, uh, interacts with the soil. And this diagram here, uh, adapted from O'Connell in 2004 uh, from a, a DEFRA report, um, shows this process very clearly where um, on the right hand side we've got the compacted layer. And this means that we're getting uh, more infiltration excess runoff occurring uh, more quickly, contributing to uh, river discharges. Uh, and less through flow uh, through the, the soil, which we uh, we get that uh, we get more of that process occurring in in uh, well structured uh, soils. Uh, so let's sort of think about the importance of soil compaction and the impacts that it has. Um, so firstly, uh, soil compaction in our agricultural landscapes. Um, Agriculture is a dominant land use in the UK, covering 70% of the land area. Um, so therefore, soil compaction could have, be having quite a significant impact uh, on the hydrological cycle. Um, and uh, agriculture is uh, an important uh, land use as well, uh, contributing significantly to the UK economy. Um, and therefore, good structure and good soil uh, could lead to um, multiple benefits in the agricultural uh, agricultural landscape through productivity as well. Uh, and this um, and productivity has increased uh, significantly in recent decades uh, by twenty percent since uh, nineteen eighty six. But this has seen uh, a, uh, an intensification of the um, ag agricultural landscape and therefore the degradation of soil structure and uh, health. And this statistic here um, shows that degradation has cost the UK economy between 0.9 and 1.4 billion pounds per year in England and Wales, uh, and uh, soil compaction has contributed uh, 472 billion uh, of this. And of that 472 million, uh, 168 million is associated with flood damages and management costs. So um, this link between uh, soil compaction and uh, flood risk isn't new, but it uh, seems to have a significant impact uh, on flooding and also uh, the productivity of the land as well, and lots of other ecosystem services. So the, the research that I'm going to be presenting today is from two uh, studies that we've carried out, uh, one uh, by one of my uh, PhD students, uh, Victoria Coates, in the uh, River Scale catchment in Yorkshire. Um, and this catchment is around about 120 kilometres squared and feeds down to the uh, city of Ripon. Um, it has a, a high uh, rainfall gradient from the uplands on the uh, west uh, to the lowland area on the east. Um, and importantly, this has uh, experienced, uh, this city of Ripon has experienced uh, six significant flood events occurring uh, since 1982. 
And the other uh, researcher I'll be talking about is directly from the Compact project, um, which Simon Deville uh, undertook um, as a postdoc on that project. Uh, it's a very similar uh, catchment area, uh, the River Sense in Leicestershire, uh, receives a very similar amount of rainfall in terms of the, the lowland part of the uh, catch, uh, scale catchment as well. And both uh, of these catchments are dominated uh, by agriculture. Um, so you can see there that over 80% of the, the sense uh, is, is used by agriculture. Okay, so um, these are the aims of the, the project. Uh, firstly, to investigate the impact of arable and pastoral uh, land management practices on soil health and structure, uh, focusing in on the physical uh, properties uh, and the process of soil compaction. And, uh, and then secondly, thinking about how this links between the field scale variations in compaction and the impact on catchment scale flood risk. Thinking about this in a little bit more detail and breaking it down, we can identify a few uh, more specific questions that we wanted to, to answer. Uh, the first one is to identify the uh, spatial variations in compaction levels at the field scale. Um, Secondly, to determine the impact of different uh, mechanisms and different land management practices on soil compaction severity. And finally, to see uh, whether the uh, fields that we studied in depth in our study were representative uh, of the uh, catchment scale variability as well. And this is now the experimental design that we used in both of our studies in the, the scale and the sense. Um, and we wanted to uh, think about the hydrological continuum uh, linking the impact of compaction uh, to the generation of runoff and flooding. Okay, so we wanted to uh, measure each of the different processes along this hydrological continuum. Um, so the first uh, uh, measurements that we took were trying to quantify the amount of compaction. And the first way in which we did this uh, was by using a dynamic uh, cone penetrometer, which is basically a, a large uh, spike that you drop a, a heavy weight onto. Um, secondly, we wanted to uh, characterize the physical soil properties, uh, principally the bulk density, uh, but also some other factors that can impact uh, this and the soil structure, uh, such as organic matter content and also particle size distributions. And this was uh, from the very top kind of six centimetres of the soil uh, taken with the, the cores that are shown there. Uh, but we also did some uh, deeper one metre cores, um, which I won't be presenting the data from today, but we, we have considered how compaction uh, varies with depth as well. And then finally, we wanted to know how uh, the uh, rainfall interacted with the soil. Um, and we did this through two ways, uh, one in the field uh, using a double ring infiltrometer and uh, secondly um, in the lab using uh, uh, the falling head test uh, to measure the uh, saturated hydraulic conductivity. And both of these basically give a measurement of the ease at which uh, water uh, infiltrates through the soil. And we also measured the soil moisture in the field as well. So this next slide shows the uh, sampling strategy that we deployed in our studies. Uh, firstly, in the uh, river uh, uh, scale catchment, uh, we identified areas of a field that we thought would be more uh, compacted than others. Um, so we assumed that the uh, area around the field gate, the tree shelter area, and the feeding trough uh, would be uh, more heavily compacted by the animals in that because they often uh, congregate or traffic uh, over those areas uh, more than others. Um, and then we uh, wanted to compare these three areas to the open field area, which we assumed would be less compacted. The uh, next uh, study in the uh, River Sense in Leicestershire, we wanted to think about these uh, characteristics more continuously over the whole field, uh, rather than just a, a metre square uh, around each of those features. Um, so we set up a, a grid structure over the uh, entire field at either a 20 meter or a 50 meter resolution, uh, dependent upon the overall uh, size of the field um, and um, measured each of the, the things that we, we talked about in the previous slide, at each of those locations on that grid pattern. 
And then finally, we wanted to assess whether these uh, field scale studies were representative of the soil characteristics and the uh, impact of uh, arable and pastoral land use on uh, soil compaction at the catchment scale as well. Um, so we uh, measured uh, these characteristics in 50 fields over the uh, sense catchment in Leicestershire, which are highlighted in that figure there. So now I want to talk through some of the results that we got uh, from this uh, the, from these two studies, uh, starting off uh, with the uh, river uh, scale catchment. And I want to present the results in the same way in which I outlined the the methods uh, through thinking about the impact on compaction firstly, then the soil properties, and then the impact uh, on the way in which water interacts with the the soil. So these results here uh, show the impact of uh, of the uh, the results for the uh, dynamic corn penetrometer of for the cattle field uh, so the four areas in the cattle field so you can see at the bottom there the open field area the feeding trough the field gate and the tree shelter area and then on the uh, y-axis we've got the depth of penetration and the way in which we used the penetrometer for these uh, experiments were uh, a single hit of the weight onto the uh, spike Okay, so this shows the depth, um, the spike went into the ground from a single hit of the, uh, the penetrometer. Um, and uh, if the uh, figure, uh, if the, the data is towards the top of the, um, the figure here, um, it will indicate that it is uh, more heavily, uh, heavily compacted, um, going in uh, a, a much shallower depth uh, compared to the, the bottom there. Um, so what you can see um, from this uh, uh, figure now is that you can see the results for the, the three different fields that we, we studied. Um, so again, for the four different areas of these three different fields with cattle, sheep, and horses uh, within them. And firstly, we can see for the uh, cattle field that the, the field gate had the highest levels of compaction. Okay, so um, towards the bottom of the figure shows the highest levels of compaction. So the this uh, the data there is uh, the wrong way around on the, the figure. Um, and you can see there um, that the, the tree shelter area um, is also uh, more heavily uh, compacted as well. When the other parts of the field, the open field area and the feeding trough seem to be less compacted, uh, and particularly the open field uh, had the, the highest amount of variability associated with it as well. And that's probably because uh, in some locations where we sampled, uh, there would be high trafficking that we couldn't identify um, and uh, areas that were less heavily uh, trafficked. On the, uh, for the, the sheep uh, field, uh, we saw that the, the tree uh, shelter area was the uh, most heavily compacted uh, parts of those fields for the sheep and the horses. Um, so importantly here, we can see that um, the variations between the different fields is uh, often not as significant uh, as within the, the single field uh, themselves in terms of the amount of variability uh, that is within them. So you get lots of variation within a single field in terms of the amount of compaction. Uh, moving on now to thinking about uh, the penetration resistance, uh, and this is just for a single uh, set of data. Um, this uh, figure here, um, shows the uh, data that we saw on the previous slide for the, the cattle field for those four uh, different areas. But now what we can do is we can think about the uh, penetration resistance uh, that we can calculate from the uh, raw penet uh, penetrometer data at any particular depth in the, the soil. Um, so this shows um, the uh, resistance at 150 millimetres in the soil. Um, and we can see here that the um, the field gate has the highest um, pen penetration resistance value, uh, followed by the tree shelter area, which uh, corresponds to what we saw entire uh, uh, depth of the the column uh, from the the previous slide. Uh, when the open field area has the the lowest uh, resistance uh, there, so fifty four kilopascals. Another way in which we can think about the uh, amount of soil compaction is through the bulk density. Um, so now moving on to the, the soil properties. Um, and you can see here uh, the same uh, type of data is presented, the four different types of the field, the feeding trough, the, the field gate, the open field, and the tree shelter area. 
and then the bulk density on the y-axis here. Um, so you can see firstly that the, the field gate is the most uh, heavily uh, compacted and has the highest uh, bulk density value uh, for the, the cattle and the uh, sheep field. Um, and the, the, in the, the horses field, um, we can see that the variability is uh, much uh, lower than in the, the other uh, two fields that we, we saw. And it's interesting to think about the way in which these uh, animals are managed uh, when interpreting this data, because horses uh, are kept in much smaller paddock areas, uh, but there are fewer animals in that smaller uh, area. So we have to think about uh, the way in which they're managed when we're interpreting and uh, thinking about this data. Another way in which we can present the data that was shown on the previous slide uh, is through this uh, probability uh, plot here. So on the, the um, x-axis, we have the bulk density, and on the y-axis, we have the percentage of the samples that had a, a value uh, of these different uh, bulk densities. Um, so you can see from this uh, figure, um, if we look from uh, 50%, uh, the 50th percentile, uh, you can see that the um, the field gate area has a significantly higher uh, bulk density for the entire uh, distribution, uh, but also at the, the 50th percentile shown there. When the other three uh, parts of the field are lower, and the, the tree shelter area has the, the lowest um, values at the um, 50th percentile, when by uh, the overall, at the, uh, the 100th percentile, uh, they all pretty much have the, the same kind of value. This slide here now shows the uh, permeability um, of the soil, so the way in which water interacts with the soil and how easily it can infiltrate uh, through the soil. Um, and this is from the, the lab experiment uh, through the falling head test. Um, again, shown for the four different areas of the fields on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, we've got the uh, saturated hydraulic conductivity in millimetres per hour. Um, so you can see here on this slide and um, that the, the feeding trough area in the cattle field has the um, lowest uh, uh, case set value, which means that the water uh, infiltrates through that soil much slower uh, than the, the other uh, three uh, categories in the, in the cattle field. The open field area has the highest uh, median value there, um, but also uh, cuts across some of the data from the, the other parts of the field as well. Um, but uh, there are statistically uh, significant differences between the four uh, different uh, uh, distributions of the data for the, from, from this field. In the uh, sheep field, we don't have statistically uh, significant uh, differences. Um, so all parts of this uh, field were very similar in terms of the infiltration rate um, of the uh, of water through these samples. Um, I should just say that these uh, tests were carried out on uh, cores that were uh, probably around about five centimeters in diameter and about six centimeters in depth. Um, and um, the uh, for the horses field, uh, we see that there are kind of two different groupings here: uh, the field gate and the feeding trough area that seem to have uh, much lower uh, values for KSAT and the infiltration rate, uh, and the open field and the tree shelter area that have a higher value. Um, and uh, this comes across in some of the other data uh, for the, the horses field, uh, where the, the tree shelter area has uh, higher values, uh, lower values of bulk density rather. Uh, and this indicates that the, uh, the impact of the, the tree roots uh, are mitigating against the uh, more uh, the, the the heavy loads that the animals uh, might put on uh, under these uh, at these locations, but also the fact that horses maybe don't uh, congregate under uh, trees as much as the other animals do. The uh, final set of data that I want to show from the, this study um, is the, the soil moisture uh, data from each of these uh, three fields with the different animals and uh, the four different areas within them. And you can see here um, that in the cattle field, um, the, um, the uh, open field area has the, the lowest uh, water content. Okay, so it's the driest soil in the open field area. Uh, and that might suggest that it's more free draining. 
uh, and possibly uh, less compacted. Uh, and we can try and tie all these different data sets together to try and identify those trends that seem to be the case in the, the cattle field at least. Um, so here we can see that all sites are statistically different to one another for the cattle and horses field, uh, particularly in terms of the open field uh, data for the cattle field. Um, but uh, in the uh, horses field, uh, it's the tree shelter area that has the uh, the lowest uh, soil moisture content, again, suggesting the impact by the tree uh, uptaking water uh, from the, the soil, again, shown in the sheep field having the uh, lowest one there in terms of the, the water content of the soil. Uh, and therefore, the, it's the, the tree shelter area that is only, is a, that is different to the other three parts of the sheep field. But the other three areas are not statistically uh, different to one another. So now if we uh, compare the three different uh, fields, um, we can find that the open field area and the, the field gate area are statistically different to one another in each of these different uh, fields, where the open field is significantly drier in the cattle field. Um, and the uh, field gate area is significantly wetter uh, in the horse field, uh, which uh, often sees the most trafficking in and out of it, suggesting that that might be why it's wetter due to uh, more compaction at the, the field gate in the, the horse's field paddock. So um, that's the, the study that we uh, did in Yorkshire. Now moving on to the work that we carried out in on the River Sense in Leicestershire and how we wanted to uh, map these characteristics more continuously over the entire field uh, rather than just concentrated around these four different parts of the field. And that's mainly because of the, the data that we got from the open field area uh, where we didn't know whether it was uh, trafficked or not. Uh, and we wanted to uh, think about these things at the, the, the field scale rather than the, the plot scale. Um, so this uh, fig set of figures here uh, show the same type of data uh, measured in the same way, but this time uh, over a grid pattern that was shown on the, the method slide uh, from the uh, previously. And this is from the field uh, with cattle in it uh, that I want to, to focus in on. So if we uh, firstly look at the, the top left plot there, which shows the, the bulk density, um, we can see that there is a, a large amount of spatial variability in the bulk density over that uh, field, uh, ranging from below one uh, at the top uh, centre um, to values around about 1.5 uh, grams per centimetre cubed uh, towards the, the bottom uh, right hand side there. Um, so you can see that we ha we can identify uh, these zones of more heavily compacted soil, uh, which which have a higher uh, bulk density associated with them. If we now uh, look at the penetration resistance uh, values, which are now uh, calculated from the uh, penetrometer uh, data uh, rather than the soil cores. Um, we can see that uh, some areas uh, correlate uh, with each other, but other areas uh, do not. Okay, so you can see uh, 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 a potentially surprising result here is that the uh, the bulk density at the center at the top um, is the, um, the the lowest bulk density has the highest uh, penetration uh, resistance um, at that point in the, the field. Um, and uh, so you can see that but other areas of the field, maybe towards the bottom of the field, uh, are more uh, strongly correlated with each other, having a high bulk density and a high uh, penetration resistance value. Uh, now, if we look at the way in which water interacts with the soil, uh, we can see the uh, the water content, so the moisture content of the soil when these uh, tests were carried. It's quite uh, uniform over the uh, most of the field. Uh, varying by uh, less uh, amount, um, but you, you can also see that that zone of a, a, a lower uh, bulk density at the top is uh, much wetter, uh, which again was a, a, a bit of a, a surprising result, which we're, we're still looking into. And then um, if you look at the hydraulic conductivity on the, the bottom uh, right uh, plot, uh, the data from this is at a, a lower 
resolution uh, than the other ones due to the uh, length of time that this test uh, takes in the lab. It couldn't be carried out on the same number of samples, uh, which is why the resolution of this plot isn't as high. Um, but we can again see uh, spatial variations in the hydraulic uh, conductivity uh, values. Uh, this time, uh, it correlates more with the uh, bulk density value um, at the top center, having a, a low bulk density and a, 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 a lower uh, saturated hydraulic conductivity there. So we also wanted to think about uh, the variations between the different land uses in Leicestershire as well, uh, to compare to our data in uh, Yorkshire. Um, so we monitored the same uh, types of fields, uh, cattle, horses, and sheep. Uh, and this is the, the bulk density uh, data from these three uh, fields. Um, so you can firstly see there is a significant variability between the uh, different land management uh, practices with the, the different uh, animals in. Uh, but this time, uh, the horse field uh, seems to be the uh, second uh, highest bulk density values, um, and the, the cattle is the, the highest, which was the same as what we saw before, being uh, the cattle being the highest, uh, highest bulk densities. And uh, we also uh, monitored both uh, arable and pastoral fields in both of these catchments. I, to simplify things today, I've only presented the pastoral data, um, but um, the levels of compaction seem to be uh, higher in the uh, pastoral fields than the arable fields that we we looked at uh, in this case. And we can also look at the uh, um, the um, penetration resistance here. Um, so you can see the um, the values here, there's much less variability between the, the three different uh, animals and three different types of land management practice. Um, but the, um, the the sheep field has the highest um, penetration resistance here, um, but these differences are less, are, are not uh, statistically uh, different to one another. So this slide now um, thinks about the, the variability between these three different fields. Uh, thinking about the within field variability and the between field variability as well. Um, so you can see here um, that um, the, the, in the cattle field, um, there was uh, lots of variation uh, in the, the, the bulk density when there was much less variability and much lower values of bulk density in the sheep field and moderate levels of bulk density in the horse field. In terms of the penetration resistance, um, you can see uh, again high amounts of, um, pen, uh, of variation uh, across the field and that's one of the, the significant outcomes of our study is that um, we've quantified the spatial variability at a high resolution uh, across these uh, different fields. But we wanted to see whether this was uh, representative at the, the catchment scale as well. Um, so we uh, monitored uh, 50 fields across the, the sense catchment. Um, and um, so we, we've got data from arable fields and pastoral fields. Uh, we have got uh, higher, uh, more data on the, the land use of these fields as well at a, a higher level. Um, but the, the data here just so, shows these two different categories. And here it shows that the bulk density from the arable field uh, was higher uh, than the pastoral field, which was slightly different to what we found in the field that we, we studied in more depth. Um, we can also see the, the infiltration rate uh, through the arable field is significantly less uh, than in the pastoral field, uh, shown there by the, the KSAT value. So to just quickly summarize uh, the uh, results from this field scale uh, study. Um, so we found that soil properties were highly heterogene heterogeneous uh, with high levels of variability within the field as between them. And we were able to uh, map these characteristics and identify areas of the field uh, that were more compacted than others. Uh, but the analysis of this data has been quite complex, uh, and this is due to these properties being influenced by natural factors, as well as the, the land management practice, uh, practices within the field as well. So some of the data uh, correlates and links together well, when the others uh, show some more 
uh, interesting, potentially, and surprising results. But this study at the, the plot scale and the field scale uh, what, uh, gave us new questions to answer in terms of upscaling this to the catchment scale. Um, so these were firstly, to, what were the impacts of catchment scale uh, uh, soil compaction? And secondly, uh, the consequence of this uh, variability of a small spatial scales for catchment scale hydrological modeling that we, we use to, to think about this at the larger catchment scale. And uh, but this isn't a simple question to to answer because we can't simply extrapolate from the plot scale uh, to the uh, catchment scale, uh, and this is due to three main reasons. Uh, firstly, uh, that the individual intervention in a particular field the impact of that uh, reduces as we upscale because of the the natural process of uh, flow attenuation. Secondly, uh, all of these interventions are spread out all over the catchment, they're diffuse, and we need to understand what their combined effect is um, to understand what the, the impact on the downstream hydrograph is. And finally, um, there are different land management practices being carried out all over the catchment. Uh, some might increase flood, uh, flood risk, some might decrease flood risk and runoff, uh, and we need to balance these out uh, to find what the, the overall cumulative effect on the downstream uh, hydrograph would be. Um, so to think about the, the catchment scale effects, we used a combination of hydrological and hydraulic modeling. Um, and the hydrological model that we used was uh, Chrome 3, uh, which was developed uh, by Simrini at Durham University. And it's a, a physically based uh, reduced complexity model uh, representing all the uh, 1D uh, hydrological processes um, of through flow, of interception, of evapotranspiration, um, et cetera. Uh, and then we, uh, the water was then routed from cell to cell in the model uh, uh, at the, the catchment scale. So now I want to present some of the results of this. Uh, and this was carried out for the uh, 2005 flood event in the uh, city of Carlisle. Um, in the Eden catchment, uh, so that's where this uh, modeling work was done. And uh, this firstly uh, shows the entire year and the, the discharge on the y-axis and uh, three different scenarios of compaction. Lightly compacted soils, which were taking standard values for the soil type in this catchment, and then along, along a, a, linear, a linear scale, uh, thinking about the impact of uh, um, the, the soil on the, on the floors, um, so moderately compacted soils and heavily uh, compacted soils. Uh, and all, the, all this data was taken from the, the literature. So as the level of compaction increased, the peak flows downstream increased. Um, so the, the caveat here uh, to say firstly is that the entire uh, 36 kilometer squared catchment of Dacre Beck, which where this modeling study was uh, done, was all uh, uniform uh, in terms of the level of compaction. This was just a, a first uh, look at the impact of compaction. Um, and you can see that there was a significant difference between the normal characteristics of the soil and the more compacted uh, soils. But what's interesting here is that difference between uh, moderately compacted soils and heavily compacted soils is very uh, minor. Um, so you can see, uh, and this is due to um, uh, the, the processes that are operating, which I'll get on to in the, the next uh, slide. Um, we also looked at the impact on droughts as well, um, and this uh, found the that he heavily compacted soils made both extremes more extreme, so, so made floods higher and uh, droughts uh, worse and more extreme. But to try and understand these results, um, we can look into the model and look at the uh, hydrological processes that are operating. So this uh, graph here shows the level of compaction on the uh, x-axis along a, a linear scale from lightly compacted soil to heavily compacted soils. And then on the y-axis, we've got the uh, percentage of precipitation that is uh, partitioned into each of the different hydrological processes. And that's what the, the different lines uh, show on the, the graph, the different processes. So firstly, uh, we found a surprising result. Um, so this indicated the amount of runoff was decreasing when we increased the level of compaction 
from 77% to 65%. And that's surprising. Uh, and you would have thought that the, the uh, flood discharge would decrease if that was the case. But if we look into it in more detail, what we see is that the proportion of this runoff as th uh, through flow through the slower subsurface pathway has decreased from 56% on lightly compacted soils to only 1% in the heavily compacted soil. So all of that rainfall is being partitioned into the fast overland runoff pathway being delivered to uh, rivers very quickly and resulting in the, the peak discharges that we saw, uh, saw on the pre previous slide. Um, we, uh, and then we saw, then we can also look at the uh, impacts on the, the soil saturation level as well. Um, so if we uh, focus in on the, the January uh, flood event, um, you can see that both the heavily compacted soil in blue and the moderately compacted soil in uh, green both reached uh, saturation at, during that flood event, which is why the difference between the amount of runoff that was being generated and the peak discharges in those two events were so minor. Um, and uh, the uh, lightly compacted soil never reached saturation. There was always storage capacity in the soil for water and rainfall to infiltrate into, and that's why the, the peak discharge was lower uh, in that peak event uh, for the lightly compacted soil. So then if we think about upscaling this uh, from the, the, the local scale, the 36 kilometer Dakerbeck catchment to the larger Eden catchment, which is 2,400 kilometers, the impact of this uh, level of compaction decreases considerably. Okay, so it was 60% at that much smaller uh, sub catchment Dakerbeck scale uh, when it was all uniformly managed. But even if we take the output of that model and use a hydraulic model to upscale that result, um, we can see that that impact is attenuated and decreased uh, significantly uh, when we upscale to the uh, Emont subcatchment and then the Eden catchment. Uh, and the impact then is only 3.5% on that peak discharge. Um, and um, the reason for this is due to the way in which the different subcatchments and tributaries interact with one another. Okay. Um, so um, I'll just quickly uh, skip actually just to get on to some of the results um what we we did was we carried out a, a sensitivity analysis um of the inflows from each of the different uh, tributaries and um then we assessed what the impact would be downstream hydrograph okay so this figure here shows the hydraulic model that we used um to shift the hydrographs from the five upper subcatchments individually and one at a time and then assessed what the impact of this would be downstream in the city of Carlisle on the peak uh, discharges. And this uh, now we'll look at the, the results. Um, so this shows the impact of changing the magnitude of the flows and the, the different subcatchments. Okay, and this uh, indicates a, 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 an obvious result really in the fact that if we decrease the uh, magnitude of the flows from the different tributaries, then we decrease the uh, magnitude of the peak. Uh, stage downstream. Obviously, some subcatchments are more effective than others. Uh, and then the, the timing of the uh, flows is much more interesting. Okay, so you can see um, that um, if we uh, delay the upper catchments, the Emont and the Eden, um, then we are going to decrease the, uh, the peak discharge downstream. But if we delay the um, the, the Coldew and the Earthing to a lesser extent, if we delay those catchments, we would make them worse. Okay, um, so if we uh, speed up the lower catchments, the Coldew and the Earthing, we would decrease the, the peak discharge downstream in the city of Carlisle. So where we do things is having a, a significant impact in terms of the effect at the, the catchment scale. Okay, so I just want to uh, quickly uh, sum up uh, with this final slide, to, and it uh, highlights an important issue to do with how we deploy natural uh, flood management, and it's where we do things matters in terms of the effectiveness of the approach at the, the catchment scale. Uh, and at the moment, um, uh, natural flood risk management is being deployed uh, over whole catchment areas 
Um, and uh, the uh, results from that modeling study there showed if we targeted things to areas, we could improve the effectiveness um, of them. Um, and if we uh, don't uh, think about this in a more strategic way, um, then natural flood risk management may at best fail to achieve the optimum flood risk reduction downstream, or at worst, actually make flooding worse. So if we delay the lower catchments and uh, hold that water back, and it arrives at the same time as the flow coming from upstream, then the peak flow uh, would be higher and, and worse. And therefore, we uh, run the risk that if natural flood risk uh, through the, the current studies that are being uh, carried out, um, th that it, uh, natural flood risk, mi risk management might be proved to be not effective. And this might be simply because of these three things here. Firstly, we haven't applied uh, natural flood risk management at the scale that it needs to be applied at to have uh, an impact at the, the catchment scale yet. We haven't uh, applied it in enough locations. Uh, second, uh, and secondly, we also need to identify the optimum set of locations to make this uh, the, the uh, have the, the uh, most effective impact um, of um, natural flood risk management. And therefore, to have a, a, a but this would not have uh, necessarily an, a positive impact on downstream flooding in all flood events. Uh, because of the the way in which uh, storms track over the catchment in terms of the antecedent conditions uh, and therefore we need to think about where we can target natural flood risk management to benefit uh, the highest proportion of flood events um, that we can uh, that we can have and at the moment we're carrying out some uh, natural flood risk uh, management optimization modeling uh, where we can try and target where we uh, deploy natural flood risk management um, so that we can improve its effectiveness. Ian, thanks very much. There's quite a lot of questions have come through on the chat. Um, are you okay to look at those? And uh, yeah, I, I can't see them at the moment. I'm just trying to um, get to the page where I can see them again. If you click on the um, speech bubble, on the sorry, the, the speech bubble um, option, you should see those. Um, there is, yeah, I can see them now. There was uh, one. We had several questions sent in beforehand, and um, one of those, which it may be beyond your research really, but was asking about the evidence of additional benefits of practices, um, for example, water retention for drought resilience. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, I think some of our initial results, uh, particularly from the, the modeling exercise that we, we undertook there, showed that um, having good soil structure, um, storing water in the soil, um, can help mitigate um, drought periods as well. So more uh, less compacted soils um, can uh, store more water, uh, have more uh, infiltration of water into the soil, uh, and therefore uh, uh, over longer time periods, and uh, therefore mitigate against potential droughts as well. Um, so um, good soil management and, and reducing compaction is likely to have an, uh, a positive impact on, on low floors as well. Yeah, there's quite a lot of questions. I think you, you did offer um, um, Ian to answer questions on in a, in a written form, ones that we didn't have time to. Is, is, that, is that okay and we can put them on the... Yeah, I can definitely uh, copy all the questions and then uh, put them in a Word document and share the answers with everyone. Yes, that's fine. Great. Uh, um, are there any now that you just uh, skimming this, through uh, them? Yeah, so there's a question to do with uh, surface capping uh, compared to uh, subsurface compaction. 
Um, so um, we, we kind of studied uh, surface compaction and uh, compaction at depth. Um, so uh, a lot of the results I presented today were uh, from the, the top six centimeters of the soil. Um, we also used a pocket penetrometer um, to identify whether the surface was capped as well, um, which we often found uh, as expected, uh, where there is bare ground uh, around feeding trough areas in particular, uh, and where you get lots of animal trafficking, um, they um, had uh, higher resistances to the, the uh, pocket penetrometer as well, indicating uh, surface capping um, in those locations. Um, and also a lot of our um, double ring infiltrometer experiments, uh, they took a, a long time, several hours to, to, to carry out. Uh, and that just in, indicates the, uh, the, the high uh, kind of cap, uh, the, the cap to the, the soil surface in, in, in many of these areas with, with bare ground. And we also looked at uh, compaction much deeper in the soil as well uh, with meter long uh, cores. Um, and uh, yeah, I can share some of the results from that if, if people are interested. Okay, any, any other, other questions which <laughs> catch your eye in the last four minutes? Okay, yeah, there's a, a question here to do with uh, comparing it to a control soil, uh, typically under hedges or in adjacent woodland. Um, so one of um, our other experiments that we've carried out is to do with the impact of uh, hedgerows on soil hydrology and flood risk, um, where we uh, measured a lot of the same kind of soil characteristics that I've talked through today um, at different distances away from a uh, hedgerow. Um, and we found uh, that the, the soil structure um, was much uh, better, uh, much uh, lower bulk densities at the hedgerow itself. Uh, compared to the, the main field area, which is more heavily compacted and, and trafficked by animals. Um, we also found that the, the soil moisture content uh, was, uh, was much lower uh, near the, the hedgerows as well. And that's indicating that they're, they're forming a, a, a hydraulic uh, gradient uh, from the field to the hedgerow. So water will be draining from the field uh, to a, a linear line uh, along the, the hedgerow. Uh, and therefore, these uh, these man-made uh, hedgerows are modifying the uh, subsurface flows in terms of the um, the the pathways in which the, the water is taking as well. Um, so, yeah, um, that's having quite a, an important uh, effect as well as the, the within field levels of compaction. Um, but there were significant differences between the two. Thanks. Just one question was, will the slides be shared? Yes, um, Ian agreed that we can put the slides on our, our website, so we'll be doing that after the presentation. Uh, Ian, any other questions that would be good to answer now? Um, so there's just a question to do with um, kind of the, the topography of the field and uh, the animal density and the kind of those kind of uh, factors that are going to influence the soil properties. Um, so we, we spent quite a lot of time choosing the fields that we, we studied. Um, we uh, typically tried to um, study as uh, fields that were as flat as possible in terms of their uh, topographic uh, gradients. Um, and we have data associated with the uh, number of animals and the, the density of animals uh, in each field, uh, which we're using to interpret uh, the, the answers uh, and, and the data that we, we've got. Okay, th thanks Ian. I think we, we've we've run out of time now. Um, if I just uh, briefly sum up. Um, th first of all, thanks very much Ian, really interesting and um, it's generated a lot of questions and um, hope the discussion can carry on after the, after the webinar. Um, if you do have any feedback or follow up questions please do please do email us um and feedback can be on how how it went for you um apologies there was a bit of noise at the beginning of uh, ian's presentation um the recording will be available on our website uh shortly after presentation and um do forward that on to colleagues who maybe couldn't join um and the the, the the next webinar will be on the part, actually on the 
NFM research program for on the Landwise project. So Chris Short and Angie Elwin for, uh, will be presenting on integrating local knowledge into NFM work and insi insights from lowland catchments in the Landwise project. Um, you can sign up to our uh, newsletter on the website, and if you do that, we'll we'll also um, alert you to um, future uh, webinars. Um, the next webinar is actually you can um, sign up to it already. The link is on our, our website, but um, we'll send you an invitation via um, Eventbrite shortly. So that, that that's all. Thanks very much for joining us, and um, hope you'll join us again next time. Okay, bye then. Thank you.